Oh, okay, so thank you guys very much. I'll try to keep things uh, keep things moving forward. Um, okay, so um, yeah, thank you for organizing this conference series. Uh, this has been a nice way to spend my Fridays for the last month. Um, and today I would like to talk to you about uh, the exploration of the Uru effect uh, using a new technique uh, involved with Rimla Horizon mechanics. And so um, uh, we're going to be analyzing some data from CERN. And so to, in order to do that, let's uh, let's see. Now we're going. Okay. So we're going to be looking at a channeling radiation experiment from CERN. Okay. We're going to look at a, a power spectrum analysis of this data. This is a little bit of background material. Okay. And then we're going to start to develop these new techniques uh, involved with uh, Rindler horizon mechanics. And what we're going to find is that the second law of thermodynamics uh, is itself a, 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 a it can be manipulated into a particle spectrum and when applied to that data that this provides a very easy way of analyzing uh, this uh, thermalized data set and then we'll start looking a little bit at some future outlooks especially with the uh, with an eye towards experiments and so uh, in general what this talk is about is looking at uh, QED in curved space time and seeing what it can say about uh, radiation emission so uh, with that in mind let's go ahead and turn to this uh, NA63 experiment from CERN this is an experiment designed to measure radiation reaction and they looked at 178.2 uh, uh, GeV positrons, so high energy positrons, which are fired into samples of single crystal silicon. Uh, in particular, we'll be looking at a 3.8 millimeter thick sample. And what you end up having is uh, due to the regular atomic array, because it's single crystal, uh, the, the lattice sites essentially function like a waveguide. So when the positron propagates through, it feels a harmonic potential and oscillates back and forth while it's uh, moving through the crystal. Um, and due to the high speed of these things, you get a very, very large enhancement from your Lorentz gamma of the electric fields. And so when the photons are emitted, you have this humongous recoil. So radiation reaction is what they're looking at. And so this was one of the first experiments that had found uh, radiation reaction in these types of systems. And so when we collect all the data, we have a power spectrum. That's energy per unit time per unit frequency. And these black data points are the data sets that we're going to be analyzing. And these various colored curves here are the standard catalog of radiation reaction models that are applied to this data set. And so what we're going to use then is we're going to look at an Uru effect type of theory applied to this data set where the acceleration of the system comes from the recoil from the radiation reaction. And so uh, with that in mind, let's start looking at some observables we can compute. Uh, for <clears throat> To analyze this, we want to get a power spectrum. So if we look at, say, the QED interaction, we have our standard gauge field, as well as our uh, semi-classical vector current for a positron, which is coupled to an inward width detector. And then, so basically what we're doing is we're looking at, you know, starting off in a vacuum, we emit a photon accompanied by a transition in our detector. And so when we compute the response function from this, we kind of have the standard structure of a scalar field response function, except this additional four velocities contracted with the polarization indices of our photon. So a nice generalization of the response function. And we're using our standard mode decompositions for our photons, and uh, the power spectrum is what we're going to compute now. So let's go ahead and look at that. Okay, so if we evaluate our, our, our positron on a uniformly accelerated trajectory, right, we can compute this power spectrum here, which is an intermediate state right here. But if you notice, right, this delta T that's up top here, when we plug in our hyperbolic trajectory, that gives us identically the Henkel, the integral formulation of a Henkel identity. Okay, so just by manipulating that, we end up with our power spectrum here, okay? And one thing that's interesting to note about it is that these Henkel functions, okay, all obey this mathematical identity, where if I flip the sign of the index, it spits out this exponential term here. And if you look, the index is this two delta E over A, and so when I flip the sign in that, that's two pi delta E over A, which is your standard Boltzmann factor that you get. And so, um, uh, uh, and that, that, that's a statement of detailed balance that transitions up or down, right? And so when we sum over both of those, we get this thermal factor, which is this guy here, right? Uh, down here at the bottom. And so uh, what I'm using here is I'm implying a technique from uh, Cozella and Matos and Benzella, these guys down in Brazil, where they were able to um, uh, keep the temperature of this Rindler bath arbitrary. And so this provides a technique to actually measure that Rindler temperature to confirm that it's A over 2 pi. And then for our energy gap, we have this general polynomial. And in principle, what each of these terms should be is the channeling oscillation frequency, the channeling oscillation frequency multiplied by its amplitude. And so this is a transverse velocity. There's going to be more, much more to say about this term right here. But this is a fiducial Rindler term, which comes with the direct comes from a direct interaction with the Rindler bath. And then we're going to have our uh, recoil uh, term. And in general, this acceleration is going to come from something like that recoil. So we'll take an average of something that looks like omega squared over 2m, which is a typical recoil acceleration. Okay, 
So now what we want to do then is look at that power spectrum. We want to best fit it to the data, but first we need to make sure that the system has time to thermalize. Okay, so this right here is a uh, thermalization time for the first best, best fit that we do. And we see that this implies that there's about a 22 GeV cutoff, uh, low energy cutoff. This light blue line is the amount of time that we're actually running the experiment. So this is the 3.8 millimeter thick crystal divided by the speed of light. Okay, so we have a good thermalization time here. And then when we compute best fits above that threshold, we see the chi squared rapidly converge into this one standard deviation threshold here. And what that means is that the theoretical curve lies inside, on average, lies inside every single data point. And so when we compare those chi squares to a standard catalog of radiation reaction models, we see that there's a significant improvement when we incorporate this Uber effect. And so we have this 22 GeV thermalization threshold. So let's go now ahead and look at the, uh, the power spectrum. So this is our power spectrum best fit to this uh, to this radiation reaction data set. We have that 22 GeV cutoff, and then at 30 GeV, this is where this chi squared goes to one. And if you notice these pink and purple curves, which are above and below here, that's whenever we deform that Riddler bath temperature by just 10% away from the fooling baby zoomer temperature. So this gives you an idea of how sensitive the data set is to the temperature of the Rindler bath. And this was uh, the proposal put forth by Cozella et al for measuring that temperature. And so it looks pretty good actually. And really quick, I'll just go through our best fit parameters. First of all, we have an overall scale S here, which just gives us the amplitude. Uh, the acceleration scale, right? We were expecting something at about 6.2 PeV. These are very high energies, okay, or very high accelerations, but it just comes from relativistic Newton's law here, okay? This is just force equals mass times acceleration. And so when you just plug in numbers, okay, you get this PeV scale uh, accelerations. And that's exactly what we measure when we best fit for these accelerations is we get PeV scale accelerations. And then our channeling oscillation term, which is this guy, okay? Uh, let me put these out here. So that's this first os uh, term right here. It's this channeling oscillation term, right? Uh, this corresponds to something along the order of an electron volt in uh, in the in the Coulombian frame, and this is typical for channeling radiation experiments, right? Uh, and so the fact that we get something consistent here is okay. But the key piece, though, is this first one, which is this term right here. This is the one that comes directly from that interaction with the Rindler bath. So this is this Rindler frequency here, which is this number, this amplitude multiplied by the lattice constant for silicon, which is the amplitude of that oscillation gives you 0 0.01, uh, 1, 1, and then our best fit value is 0 0.012. So this is the transverse velocity, uh, the, the fiducial Rindler term that we measure. So this is something that we're going to be looking at again, but this is one that confirms that we're actually dealing with uh, uh, the Unruh effect here. Um, and then just for completeness, we can take the average accelerations, compute a temperature from it, and then we can compute the average of those Rindler temperatures that we measure. And we see that indeed the temperature of that Rindler bath is the fooling Davies Uber temperature here. Uh, with an upper bound at the highest frequency around 2 PeV. And so this was that uh, realization of that proposal put by, forth by Cozella for measuring that temperature based on a resonant interaction with the Rindler bath, which is this A1 term here, which we confirm. Okay, so that's old stuff. Now let's turn to the new stuff, okay? So what we want to do then is go back, we want to analyze this data set here, but we don't want to look at power spectrum with best fits because these things can be pretty complicated, right? What we want to do is come up with a clever way to do this, right? And that's based off of uh, Rindler horizon thermodynamics, right? So when you think of the Unruh effect, right? You're going to have some emitter here, some positron or whatever, right? It's going to be at some distance one over A from the horizon, and it will emit particles into this Rindler bath and hit these particle-antiparticle pairs and essentially annihilate one while one comes out of the Rindler horizon, or you can have like a particle-antiparticle pair gets created, one gets absorbed, and the other one comes out. And so this is kind of a, you know, a kind of a cartoonish way of thinking about this Uber effect, which is the emission and absorption of these Rindler particles. And each time, and every one of these photons that comes through, right, um, is the photons that we measure in the lab frame, okay? And so this covariant description offers an easier way to do it because it's based entirely off the second law of thermodynamics here, okay? So let's develop this a little bit further here. So if I have the second law, uh, dq equals kb tds, okay? Our Riddler frequency, which is gauged by that transverse velocity, the one that we were able to measure in that uh, power spectrum, right, is going to set the uh, the heat flux across that Riddler horizon. So the heat flux across the Riddler horizon has to come from that Riddler frequency, okay? We know that it's beta perp times the photon frequency, okay? So that sets our dq. Their temperature, we're going to be using that recoil temperature. Um, so here it's just omega squared over 2m. Uh, there's a little bit of ambiguity in what this uh, what the what the emission time is. So I have this alpha t here. So depending on what it, way I'm analyzing it, I can set this equal to two or pi. But this is a number that I'm trying to pin down here. But it's something of order unity, one half 
to something like this, right? Um, and one of the other things that's interesting about this is that you find because this uber temperature is in the proper frame, which is heavily boosted. But if you want to analyze the system in the lab frame, you have to see how temperature boosts. And this showed that, at least for this system, that the temperature boosts is one over gamma. And this, uh, I typed this up, and this got an honorable mention for this uh, Gravity Research Foundation essay competition. So this was kind of a cool result with this. Moreover, even more cool stuff is that there was a recent paper, uh, uh, not so recent actually now, but by uh, Serena uh, Alonzo, uh, Alonzo Serrano and, and Matt Visser, which showed that even for a black body radiator, right, if you have just a general distribution of uh, photons which obey a, a Bose-Einstein distribution or a Planck distribution, that there is an amount of entropy per photon that stays in there, okay? And they computed this number. And so what that means is I can map an entropy to photon number whenever we're thermalized here, okay? And so with this temperature, with that heat flux from the Rindler horizon, and then with this mapping between entropy uh, and photon number, we can develop a spectrum, okay? Here I define alpha as this combination of this alpha S, the alpha T, and then the beta is this alpha here. And so this is gonna be just some overall best fit parameter. And then it's just one over KBT. And so this is that pure data that we'll be looking at. We're, we're gonna to try to best fit this to, okay, just for this fit alpha. And I also, uh, as a new update, we were able to come up with another way to measure thermalization time, which is completely model independent. So it's not based off power spectrum. It's not based on any theory. I just take the data and compute the thermalization time or the emission time from that data set. And so this gives you a 12 GeV cutoff. But I just want to point out something that this is this 3.8 millimeter crystal. If you look at this, this is only basically a factor of two that's in between the experimental cutoff and then our thermalization time. So it's not like we're well below this thing. We're right at the very edge. And this thermalization time has been a tough uh, cookie to crack for this Uru effect. And so this is just shows you how close we made it. Okay. So let's go ahead and apply it. All right, we do our best fit for this figure uh, parameter alpha. We get 1.62, okay? Um, this alpha T can come from the acceleration. We, we, we know that these accelerations are at just a PEV scale. So I just assume that the acceleration is at something on the order of one PEV. And this enables us to compute that beta term, okay? And this shows us that we have agreement between the power uh, spectrum analysis where we got uh, uh, 0.012 and then our best fit based off of the second law of thermodynamics here, we get 0 0.022 plus or minus the 0.14. Where well, this error bar comes from that error bar, uh, the errors from the, the entropy per photon. And so this light blue line here is where this alpha is set equal to one and then the red is where we do that best fit for this 1.62 though. So it shows you just some factor of order unity, which is this combination of this uh, uh, transverse velocity, uh, emission time and uh, entropy per photon. And then once we have that though, right, what we can do is we notice that there's this positron mass that's sitting over here, okay? We can take this entire spectrum and flip it on its side and solve for the positron mass and then use the data itself to actually measure the positron mass, okay? And so what happens then is um, you see this convergence, right? We basically, we're multiplying this power spectrum by omega squared. This goes as one over omega squared. So this thing becomes flat above that thermalization cutoff here, okay? And so we get a reasonable value for our, it's, you know, there's a lot of scatter, so it's not supposed to be a high precision measurement, but it just shows that these NA63 experiment with recoil is just basically a broadband mass measuring thermometer. This spectrum that you see here is just one over KBT, and so this is a direct measurement across multiple recoils of this Uru temperature. And so you see that, uh, I mean, it fits quite well, everything looks very good. And so this is kind of the current status of this, uh, of, of, of this analysis. And just to show how robust it is. So I have typed this, this analysis up. It's now out for review, second round of peer review now. But I just wanted to comment that these types of experiments are actually robust and these analyses are robust in these experiments. And so there's other data sets from NA63. And so this is kind of preliminary results that I'll show you for a 50 GeV positron. So much lower energy, but for a suite of crystal thicknesses. And so just to show you what's going on here, the top row is for a one millimeter crystal, the middle row is for a two millimeter crystal, and the bottom row is for a four millimeter crystal. And here we have, in this case, the best fit power spectrum, but we see in this case, the one millimeter, we do not have time to thermalize. Our uh, second loss spectrum basically kind of looks like garbage, and our mass spectrum doesn't even converge, okay? But then now for the two millimeter crystal, we're kind of right on that razor's edge where, where are we thermal, are we not? But it looks like we're able to kind of get away with it. And so we see the convergence and then for the four millimeter crystal where, where we're good to go and we see the convergence wherever we need. Likewise, this is more crystals that we have, six millimeter samples. And again, we see uh, that the thermalization time is upheld in both cases and we see the convergence and very nice spectrum. What's interesting about these two 
is that it's the same crystal, same beam, but they change the incident beam angle. And so what that does is that gauges that transverse velocity. And so what this is, is a tuning of that Rindler frequency in the Rindler bath. So it's a tunable interaction with that Rindler bath that we're seeing right here. And so these experiments and these systems offer a very, very nice way to look at things. We can probe this alpha parameter that I showed, which is this uh, Rindler coupling with emission time and entropy per photon. You can measure things like positron mass. And even if there's other processes there, some like higher order harmonics or, or um, uh, spin flips or any other sort of thermodynamic object that can be lumped in as a chemical potential or anything that can go into the second law, you could solve for this thing and potentially probe them in these systems. And so this kind of just shows that uh, that particle physics, namely ones with radiation reaction or the anything that has large accelerations can probe these, this Uru effect and we have a nice way of looking at it with this thermodynamic uh, spectrum. And so then just to kind of close up things, if we talk about experiments, right, we've seen that NA63 has some nice experiments, right, here's some of their data sets. There's also a lot of consortiums that are developing for um, electron, uh, high energy electron laser beam uh, interactions. And so there's people that are applying for money with these Slack with the FACET2 lab is looking at these high energy electron laser ex uh, experiments. Um, and the Annabelle experiment, which is going to be a plasma mirror so to probe things like the fooling Davies effect or the moving mirror effect. And then also at NIST in radiative beta decay, we're able to see things or, or potentially see things where there's thermality. And so I think that in particle physics, there's a lot of uh, potential for, as already been seen, for measuring the effect and for exploring it. And so just to conclude, uh, Udo effect using recoil, uh, recoil acceleration with sufficiently quick, uh, uh, thick crystals can give us a way to look at the Udo effect. Larmor emission with the uh, thermalization that uh, describes this data. And then there's this new kind of covariant description using Rindler horizon dynamics that de describes the data quite well. And it's uh, robust across multiple data sets now. Uh, uh, yeah, just, yeah, okay. And then uh, and perspectives about uh, particle physics thermalizing in these experiments. I would like to just give a short uh, advertisement to Mike Good, whose talk is in one week. And he'll be describing another experiment from this uh, radiative beta decay from NIST where we see thermalization with a 1D plank, uh, plank distribution. And so thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rick, for all this uh, this mess with the Zoom stuff. And uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to ask. And, and thanks again. Yeah, thank you so much, Morgan. Um, yeah, are there any any questions from, from the, the Zoom audience here? If so, you can feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask. I hope I wasn't talking too fast. That was a little jittery running around getting his computer fixed. No worries, no worries. Uh, the, I do have a, I do have a question though. It's uh, yes, so I, I think that this whole idea of probing the the unreflecting directly by probing the the well the radiation from the acceleration, I think, is very interesting. It's a very interesting program. The the thing that I wonder is, um, so usually you need to have an energy gap in order to really be able to get your your system to thermalize, right? In yeah, the yeah. typical sense of thermalizing, right? So say mm -hmm. in the case of the the protons in the in CERN. Uh, what would be the, the corresponding energy gap uh, that the protons would have? Because, of course, you could, don't measure whether the protons are thermal in the end or not. What you measure is the re acceleration radiation from that. But yeah, the radiation. If you have trans, access to the proton, uh, what would be the energy gap in that case? So typically what you have is uh, um, whatever process is happening in the coating frame, is usually going to be, uh, you know, so it's the spin flip. In this case, what we have is multiple, so there's multiple examples of things, okay? Two examples are not grounded in the literature in terms of Uber effect, one is. So the first one is this uh, oscillation frequency omega. So as the positron is, 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 is or decelerating actually, right? It's oscillating transversely. Okay, and then so the idea for how this came from is looking at uh, Cherenkov radiation. Okay, so if I look at Cherenkov radiation with an UNRU detector, if I have a co-moving oscillation that's there, right, it just presents itself as the frequency and the energy gap. And that's a, but basically this is the anomalous Doppler effect. So I had anomalous Doppler effect as an example to, to claim that this omega is going to be there, okay? Likewise for recoil, the, the, the recoil correction to Cherenkov is known, you can compute it just kinematically, and that's where you get this recoil kinetic energy from, okay? So these two things were guesses, okay? Now there is literature from Marinus that shows that um, there is going to be a, a, a term like this that comes from the Uner effect, so this one is going to be in the literature, but the important one, for at least what I was doing, this comes from this work from Matsus and there was uh, uh, from Kozella uh, on, on how to measure the Uru effect using uh, essentially a, a combing cyclotron oscillation. And there was also a paper from Patankar and Kolokar who looked at um, uh, the Uru effect with transverse drift, 
Okay, and for those cases, as well as in this paper, whenever I computed this one, you go in the Rindler frame and, it, and you show, actually you can show that it's the transverse oscillation, that it's this term specifically that you resonantly couple with um, from the Rindler bath, right? And that's the term that's necessary to develop the covariant description. So I compute some process in the Rindler frame, and then I compute some process in the lab frame that's accelerated to make them covariant. It's this term that does it, okay? And so this is the one that you get. And so in general for, you know, how do you get a two-level system on a positron? You know, it's not like something's clicking. It's the, it's, it's what's, what sort of dynamics are occurring in that co-moving frame? If it's a spin flip, it's a transverse thing. And that's, that's the one that, that gives it to you. And so, yeah, and the recoil one as well, uh, that was done by Reedus. I wasn't aware of that when I did this, but yeah, the recoil one has been shown that it's actually a, it, what formalizes uh, the transverse recoil actually is, is identically. And this comes from a, uh, you know, Volkov states quantizing things in laser fields. I mean, it's a very rigorous uh, derivation of that one. But yeah, so so co-moving oscillations, co-moving processes sets energy gaps for fundamental particles. I see, I see. Thank you so much. That, that's very interesting. All right, so let's thank uh, Morgan again.